Amen. How wonderful it is to know that we pray to a mighty God who not only hears our needs and our concerns, but He knows them already. And He has made provision. He has made provision. How wonderful our God is. I invite you to join me once again in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. Uh, we do have a lot of things planned for the Christmas season and many events. And, uh, you know, some folks have wondered, man, is he just going to stay in Exodus right through Christmas? Not all the way, but uh, a portion of the way for sure. We're going to do that, continue. Because there's so much correlation here, there's so much parallel that uh, God was preparing his people and delivering them for the Messiah and for the Savior. And so we want to uh, continue to understand these things. So Exodus chapter 12, we're going to pick up in verse 21 uh, this morning when we get to the text there as we learn that God does indeed deliver. He delivers. Our, our whole theme this series has been deliver us. And we get to passages like today where we see that God indeed delivers. But as always, I like to start with a, question, with a question, and so I ask you the question this morning, how many of you like to wait? I'll even ask for a show of hands on that one. Normally I say, I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many of you like to wait? I love waiting. Waiting's my thing. I just enjoy waiting. I, I love the, uh, the boredom, the monotony, uh, the frustration, you know, that which was once considered an opportunity to relax, an opportunity to maybe even think about some things, some, an opportunity to, to recollect yourself and, and, and uh, to rest up, but it's now a source of immense frustration for us. We hate waiting, and we hate waiting because we live in an instant gratification culture. Too many things come to us too quickly. They come to us easily. We've got everything in an instant. We can prepare meals in an instant. We want things now. We want things done. We don't like waiting at red lights. We don't like waiting in line at stores. And we especially, according to social media, don't like waiting at a restaurant on our meal. We don't like to wait. Not to mention the dreaded, they even gave it that name, right? The dreaded waiting room at the doctor's office. You know that place, that place where time stands still? That place where the world stops moving on its axis? That, time, that, that place where nothing happens and they, they, they literally, I mean it's like, I got a good name for it, let's call it the waiting room. You know, that thing that everybody hates to do. That thing that everyone loathes and despises. Let's call it that. Because that's what it is, right? We hate to wait. We can't stand waiting. We even hate waiting on God. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, and I want you to be honest with yourself this morning, we don't like waiting for anything, but we don't like waiting on God. We want everything in an instant. We want instant gratification. We want an immediate answer to our prayers. We want an immediate fulfillment of our needs, or at least those things that we perceive as our needs. A lot of those things are just simply our desires. But when it comes to the things that we ask from God, we want it, and we want it now, right? And I don't understand why God's not answering my prayer. Well, you know what? Maybe He is answering your prayer. In fact, I believe He is answering your prayer, but we don't accept no for an answer. And we certainly don't accept not now. Do you know those are legitimate answers? And in fact, they're needed answers. They're good answers. They're holy answers. They're godly answers. But we don't like those answers. We want that gratification Immediately, Yet one of the most important exhortations in all of God's word is for us to wait upon the Lord. Over and over scripture tells us to wait upon the Lord. David puts it this way in Psalm 27. He says, wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. In other words, our strength and our courage are exercised 
as we wait? How do you get stronger? How do you get more courageous? How do you, how do you stand in these difficult times? How do you stand on the Lord's faithfulness when you learn that He's faithful? And it takes time to learn it. Wait on the Lord. You know, it's difficult for us to wait at a red light because we got places to go. It's difficult for us to wait in line at store because we got things that we need to do. We're ready to get back home or whatever it is. We don't like waiting at the restaurant for our food because we are hungry. I mean, we have gone like at least four hours without a meal. So we don't like to wait. But can you imagine having to wait through oppression? Can you imagine waiting through persecution? Waiting through pain and suffering. Waiting for deliverance. We don't know how long the plagues lasted. The plagues against Egypt. We don't know how long Israel is waiting through those plagues for their deliverance. The Mishnah, which is... Jewish commentary tells us that they, it was about a year, but you understand that they make the calculation. Their time starts ticking at the burning bush. So you've got a, a lot for the time for Moses to get to, uh, to meet Aaron and get back to Egypt and, and have, uh, have everything that goes on between them and Pharaoh. Many people estimate somewhere around five months, and that's where I stand. There are those that say ten months, one month for each plague. Uh, there, there are some that, that shorten it. I've, I've seen estimates of somewhere between two or three months. So the scripture doesn't communicate that to us. It, it tells us how long a few of the plagues lasted, but it doesn't tell us how much time span there is between the plagues. But I, I think that we can understand as we're processing through some of the seasons, we're told about some of the harvest that are taking place regarding the plagues. I think somewhere around five months is a good estimate that they're having to wait, but five months is nothing when you consider the fact that they have been in Egypt for over 400 years. At least a hundred of those years they've been in slavery. That's enough time for a a, a generation or two. If we look at the lifespans that that were in effect at that time, and you understand that lifespans are diminished by slavery. And so a few generations have lived under that persecution, have lived under that oppression. That's a long time to wait for deliverance. That's a long time to wait for freedom. But God was moving to accomplish His will in accordance with His perfect timing. And so Israel had to learn to wait. You know, in the final plague against Egypt, God passed over the children of Israel. Here we get to the point of deliverance. Beginning in verse 21 of Exodus chapter 12, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, And apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. So they've already received this instruction and it's on the 14th day of in, in that time, using the Canaanite calendar, Abib, that he goes and, and he tells the nation of Israel, now it's time. You, you've brought that lamb in a few days ago. It's time to slaughter that lamb. It's time to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And, and, and you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of your homes so that it will be a sign to the Lord that judgment has already taken place at this house. That a price has been paid, a sacrifice has been made. But here in verse 22, we get an added instruction that we don't find in the previous instruction concerning Passover. He says, You are to remain under, you are to remain in the home. You are to remain under the protection of the blood until the plague has passed. Don't go outside. You know, I think that would be very hard for us as Southerners. 
If, if any evidence of that is, has anything to do with the way we do tornadoes, you know. There's a tornado warning. It's been spotted on the ground. And what do we do? We go outside. You know, I, I, we've got this innate desire. We've we, we got to see. <laughs> i got to see what's happening. i got to see what's going on. But listen, he says, stay under the protection of the blood. Don't leave the covering. Don't leave the covering. Remain in obedience to God. Don't step outside of His protection. I think there's a lesson there that all of us could take and apply in our lives. And then I want you to see something else in verse 23 that God says here, that God Himself would pass through the homes of Egypt and the homes of Israel. Do you see what He says there in verse 23? For the Lord will pass through. And smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over the door. And will not allow the destroyer. To come into your houses. To smite you. God himself would pass through the Egyptians. And over the homes of Israel. He went before the destroyer. And he had authority over the destroyer. This is. An agent of the Lord. This is not, the destroyer here is not some demon. And it's certainly not uh, someone who is in legion with Satan. This is the angel of death who is with the Lord. And and the Lord himself goes through Egypt and passes over. He himself passes over the homes of Israel. When he sees the blood on the doorpost and upon the lintels. And he instructs the destroyer. He will not allow the destroyer to go into those homes. You need to understand that the only time the angel of death is a destroyer is when he deals with those who are outside the covenant of God. For us, he's not a destroyer. For those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for those of us who who believe in Him, for those of us who are safe and secure in Christ, for us, the angel of death is the greeter to the gates of glory. He's not the destroyer. He's the welcomer. And He ushers us into the kingdom because the blood of the Lamb is applied to the hearts of our lives. And judgment passes over us. The observance of the Lord's Passover was to be observed as an ordinance forever. It was to be taught to each generation as a memorial of God's judgment and mercy. Verse 24, he says, And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. It's a perpetual observance. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as He promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, What does this rite mean to you? You shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. When he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. They were completely obedient. We need to be completely obedient as well. And we also need to have. Listen we need to have some observances. That point our children and our grandchildren to Christ. The reason the Lord gave these feasts to Israel was not so that they would have some holidays on the calendar and get a couple of days off during the year. There was a purpose here. The purpose was worship, but it was also educational. It was so that they would understand. It was so that the righteousness of God, the power of God, the miracles of God, all that God had done for them would be passed on to the next generation. And I hear it. I hear people complaining. Our kids don't know. Our children don't know. Our gen- the next generation doesn't know. It's because we haven't told them. And it's because we've really forgotten the things of God. We often in our homes, many, many people celebrate something that doesn't look anything like the Passover. Now I understand that we're not Jews 
And therefore, our Passover would look different. But listen, we have received the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb. We have received Christ Jesus our Lord. And as a result, our sins will be passed over. Our, the judgment has already come. We have judged ourselves as sinful. And we have repented of our sins. We need to be doing things in our homes that make our kids ask, why do we do this? And if it all revolves around the things that the secular world promotes and commercialized America exalts, it's all about parades and lights and decorations and fantastical characters, we've blown it. We've missed the point. We need to do some things intentionally so that our children, our grandchildren say, why do we do this? And you can give the biblical, holy, righteous answer so that they understand the goodness and the power of God and His passing over our sins so that we will be completely obedient to the Lord just as the nation of Israel was. Then God revealed His power. He passed over the children of Israel, and he revealed his power. Verses 29 and 30. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. That's it. Two sentences. Two sentences to communicate the final blow, the final play. That which everything else has building, been building up to. As we called this the battle royale from the, from the beginning. This is, this is the tenth round. This is it. This is, the, this is the last plague. That tremendous plague. Two sentences. But that's enough. That's enough because we've been prepared for it. We've been hearing about it. We knew the tragedy was coming. You know it's a tragedy to lose a child. Those families that have experienced that know the pain. Know the loss. Know how terrible that is. But in the ancient world, the firstborn of each family was held in high esteem. The firstborn son received a double inheritance and eventually inherited the father's responsibility of caring for the home, of being head of the family. But you see, Pharaoh had mistreated God's firstborn nation and judgment was due. God had said in chapter 4, Verses 22 and 23, that you shall say to Pharaoh, and speaking to Moses, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. God was also executing judgments against all Egypt's false gods. We saw, we, we saw last week in chapter 12 and verse 12, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. All of them. All of them. I've got a little picture here of a few of them. Osiris there in the middle. Osiris is one of the highest gods of Egypt. One of the highest deities of Egypt. He is responsible for fertility, he is responsible for uh, agriculture, he is res responsible for life, he is responsible for death, he is responsible for the resurrection. His wife Isis next to him, also responsible for many things, Horus and Anub Anubis and all that. These gods were all defeated. Over 80 gods of Egypt, God executed his judgment 
against all of them. Because there is only one true God of heaven and earth, and His name is Yahweh. And Yahweh exalted Himself over the false god of Egypt. And in doing so, He kept His promises to His people. In executing His power, He keeps His promises. Chapter 12, verse 31. Then He called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among My people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless Me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we will all be dead. If we don't put an end to this, if we don't get rid of these people, if we don't get Israel out of here, we're going to be crushed. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, before it had time to rise, with their kneading bowls bound up in the cloths on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. God kept His promises. At the burning bush back in Midian, God had told Moses that these things would happen. Uh, we see it in chapter chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. He says, I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on, the, on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. God said this would happen, and it happened. And it happened just as He said. He, he revealed this in His final plague to Pharaoh but from the very start. As I've already read in chapter 4, verses 21, 22, and 23, He said this is what's going to happen. He told Moses, when you go back to Egypt, See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I told you before that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart started with Pharaoh, and eventually God gave him what he wanted. He turned him over to what we would call a reprobate mind. And then he puts to death the firstborn of Egypt. It was promised again in detail in chapter 11. Verses 1 through 8, he says, One more plague I'm going to bring on Pharaoh in Egypt, and after that he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. And he goes through that plague and how it will happen and how they will once again plunder the Egyptians. In fact, over 600 years earlier, God had promised that these things would happen. He had promised Abram, the father of the nation, the father of Israel, that these things were going to come to pass. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not yours, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. 600 years before it happened, God said it was going to happen, and it was going to happen this way. God kept. His promises. Egypt and her false gods had been judged and Israel was coming out of bondage with many possessions. It would later be recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to His people Israel according to all that He promised. Not one word has failed of all His good promise which He promised through Moses His servant. God. Keeps his promises. And as promised, Israel was being sent out. They weren't just being released. The people were going, get out of here. Get away from us. They feared for their lives. Pharaoh and the Egyptians wanted them out of the land immediately. And then uh, there's something that I don't want you to miss. There in Exodus 12, verse 32. 
Pharaoh says, take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me also. In total humiliation, Pharaoh who believed himself to be God on earth, the representative of all the deities of Egypt, said, really, this is not repentance, and you'll see that later as we go through. He's not repenting, but he's saying, stop cursing me. Every time you leave my presence, you leave with a curse. You tell me that a plague is going to happen. Bless me also. It's really a request to be done with me. Well, the Lord and Moses would have left things alone, but you're going to see that Pharaoh wouldn't. He wouldn't. But it's really a pitiful request here at the end. And finally, God delivered his people. Picking up in verse 37, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot aside from children, which means possibly 2 million people if you count women and children. If uh, There's a lot of debate. You can read 100 commentaries and get 100 different suggestions about these numbers and how many they were. But I believe it was a great number. I believe it was a multitude. I have no reason to doubt the report, the record of God's word. A mixed multitude also went up with them along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened since they were driven out of, the, out of Egypt and could not delay. Nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The exodus began immediately after the plague. The plague happened at midnight, even before dawn broke, Pharaoh said, get out. Called them in. Get out. And it happens in full view of the Egyptians as they grieved. In fact, the record of Numbers, chapter 33, verses 3 and 4, says they journeyed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month. When did they slay the Passover lambs? On the 14th. So on the very next day, on the next day after the Passover, the sons of Israel started out boldly in the sight of all the Egyptians while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn whom the Lord had struck down among them. The Lord had also executed judgments on their gods. Israel is walking out victoriously and Egypt has been humbled and defeated and emotionally they are shattered. They have been plundered as well financially by the nation of Israel. Jacob's family of about 70 that came into Egypt had grown into a great multitude. But notice who goes out with them. A mixed multitude goes out with them. Numbers 11 is going to later call that mixed multitude a rabble. It's not a term we use a whole lot, a rabble. But a bunch of complainers. A bunch of people that were frustrated with the way things were going. They were frustrated with Yahweh. They were frustrated with Moses and Aaron. They were frustrated with Israel. They're complainers. They're a mixed multitude. They're not really part of Israel. Listen, there have always been tares among the wheat. Wherever you find God's people, you will find in their midst those who are not really a part. The New Testament is going to talk about them going out from us and saying that they really never were a part of us. There have always been tares amongst the wheat. There will always be tares amongst the wheat. And what a tear is, is a weed. It doesn't produce fruit. It's taking up space. It's not a part 
of the family. It's not a part of the people of God. They're going to be the ones who Jesus talked about that said, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things? Lord, Lord, did we not join the church? Did we not attend Sunday school? Did we not give? Did we not do this and did we not do that? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, ye who are wicked, for I never knew you. This mixed multitude goes up with Israel, goes out of the nation of Egypt. Israel was delivered according to God's promised timing. And again, the ordinance of Passover is addressed for the third time in chapter 12. I think God's serious about Passover. I've got my own opinion about how he feels about our Easter's, which for the most part are not biblical. But I know how he feels about Passover. And I think we can see it as he talks about it for the third time here in chapter 12. And he talks about it for the third time due to this mixed multitude. He gives more instruction on who could and who could not partake. Because there were those who left with Israel who were not part of the covenant. So he says it is a night to be observed for the Lord. For having brought them out of the land of Egypt, this night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. I hear sometimes people talk about the feasts of Israel. Israel has a couple of feasts, but Passover is not one of them. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. These are not Israel's feasts. These are God's feasts. These are feasts of the Lord. They belong to Him. And He says here, this is, this is my feast. I, I, I mean, it's okay for us to have some holidays that are our holidays, that are American holidays, but we need to have some God holidays. We need to have some God holy days. Some days on which we are not only celebrating, not only worshiping, not only praising the Lord, but also where we're passing down the rich truths of God's Word to the next generation. This is God's feast. It belongs to him. And so he says that the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. But every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it so that it could not be separated and taken to another house. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come to near to celebrate it. And he shall be like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. In other words, only those who shared in the covenant, the seal of the covenant, the sign of the covenant in that day was physical circumcision. Only those who are part of the covenant could partake of the Passover. And he gives these instructions because of this mixed multitude. And the emphasis is on Israel's obedience to God, which led to their deliverance by God. Why were they delivered? Because they were obedient. Verses 50 and 51, then all the sons of Israel did so. They, they did what God had commanded them to do. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Listen, have you received God's mercy and grace this morning? Like Pharaoh, we all deserve judgment. We all deserve judgment. But some don't think they'll ever be judged. Some people live like little Pharaohs, filling their pyramids with material possessions and searching after popularity and fame and seeking to fulfill their own desires and entertain themselves. We live here in an American culture that gives us great opportunity to do all of those things. But all the little pharaohs will seek meet the same judgment that the pharaoh of Egypt met. They will be brought low.
but you can receive God's mercy. You can receive God's grace today by receiving the Passover lamb. By applying the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to your heart, to your life, to your mind. Trusting in Him. Trusting in Him for your salvation. So I ask you this morning, will you join the exodus? Not as part of the mixed multitude. Not as part of the rabble. But will you come under the covenant of Jesus Christ this morning? And will you join those who are His? Will you join the Lord's congregation? Will you join the Lord's family? Will you join in the covenant promises of Jesus Christ? And will you be part of the exodus from sin? We, we're not going to be delivered from captivity in Egypt, but we can be delivered from sin. That's God's desire for us. All of this is simply a metaphor. It happened. It's true. It's a historical metaphor of what God was going to do through Jesus Christ. And those things have been accomplished. It has been done. And now we can leave the darkness of sin. We can leave the captivity of iniquity. And we can walk in righteousness and holiness before God. We can be delivered by Him so that we look like Him. So that we are holy even as He is holy. So that we can exalt Him in our lives. And so that through us, all the families of the earth will be blessed because they will see and hear and meet Jesus through us, the Passover Lamb. I want to invite you as we enter into this Christmas season, which is a, a great opportunity for evangelism. It's a great opportunity to share about the greatest gift that has ever been given to humanity. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Passover Lamb, the final sacrifice, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Will we live our lives? Will we celebrate this season in such a way that others will be blessed through us? Not because we encourage them, not because we make them smile, not because they have a better day, but because they come to know Jesus is Lord and Savior. Will you be his witness? Will you be delivered? If there's anyone here this morning that would profess Christ as Lord and Savior, if you would like to talk about what that means, Brother Brian and I will be here at the front. Come see one of us. If you would this morning join the exodus from the world and partner with us, partner with this family, this faith family in mission and ministry and doing that which God has called us to do, then would you come this morning? Maybe there's some things you need to lay down. Oh, child of God, then here's the altar. Lay them down so that you might walk out of here delivered and be part of the exodus from sin. Maybe there's a friend or a family member you need to lift up, you need to pray for. Would you bring them before the Lord this morning? How might you respond? God delivers. Will we be part of His deliverance? You come as we stand and sing.